Okay, everybody. Welcome to the first installment of Evolution for Creationists. I'm just going to give this a second to click through on YouTube, make sure everything looks good, uh, and then we'll and then we'll get going. And I will I will uh, try not to disappoint you or everybody else here. I'll try my best. So I'm just making sure everything seems to be working. Can I hear everything? Let's see. Everything looks good. Fantastic. All right. So if anything is not working at any point, just let me know. If the slides aren't moving, if you can't hear me, let me know in the chat and I will, um, I'll fix whatever I need to fix. So um, like I said, welcome. This is Evolution for Creationists, uh, episode number one. And today we're going to talk about Darwin and evolution by natural selection. Before we get into it, let me just give you kind of a basic rundown of, of what we're doing here. Um, so basically the idea is this, uh, for those of you here that participate in the evolution and creation discussion on the internet generally, but YouTube specifically, you may have noticed that many participants in this discussion do not have a strong foundation in evolutionary biology, which is not anybody's fault. I mean, most people are not biologists and have not studied evolution in any kind of systematic way. And that's fine. Um, but I think that everybody uh, participating in this ought to have an understanding of the basics. So what I want to do here is provide an opportunity, not just for creationists, for anyone that wants to, to learn kind of the basic foundations of evolutionary biology. I want to provide an opportunity for uh, people to do that. So this uh, series, and I don't know exactly how long this is going to run, but this series is going to be basically one of my classes that I teach, but cut down into smaller pieces. So instead of like, like an 80 minute uh, lecture, this will be like shorter chunks, um, but it'll cover basically the same material in a somewhat stripped down, more focused way is the idea of what we're going to do here. Um, and what we're going to do is go through kind of um, a bunch of topics starting really, really basic really basic. Like today we're going to cover Charles Darwin, what he did, and how he developed the theory of evolution by natural selection. And that's it. We're going to stop there. And then as we go forward, we'll cover more and more complex things. So after today, the next uh, episode is going to be on the development of evolutionary theory after Darwin. So uh, talk about Wallace's contributions. We'll talk about um, Mendel and Morgan and genetics, and we'll get into the modern synthesis and then what's changed since then. That'll be next time. Right. And then from there, we can get into things like phylogenetics. We can talk about abiogenesis. And eventually we'll get into the really fun stuff like the mechanisms, like natural selection, like genetic drift. Uh, we'll do genetics and quantitative genetics. And then that kind of opens the floodgates. And then we can talk about the more complex things like the evolution of sex and sexual selection and life history traits. We can look at disease evolution and evolutionary medicine. We can look at mechanisms of how new traits form. We can look at uh, how you can do phylogenetics with species, but also with genes and how those two things are sometimes in conflict with each other. Um, so we'll cover a lot over however long this series runs. My intention is to do this once a week. I don't know if that's going to be possible. I don't know if that's going to work out, but that is the goal. Um, and we'll keep the chunk short and we'll just, we'll cover what I think it's important to cover over the course of however long this, this series goes on. Um, so as we go through, you will notice something. Uh, it's that I don't mention creationism or creationists at all in this series. Um, and that's because it's not relevant. The point of this series is going to be uh, to lay the, the basic foundation of evolutionary biology for the people who want it. That's different from what I do in my other series, which is specifically about uh, refuting creationist arguments. Right? So we're doing, we have two different goals. Uh, we're doing two different things. This series is, this is about evolutionary biology. This is not about uh, creationism. So just keep that in mind as we go. Um, if you're expecting me to go through this and be like, ha ha, this is where creationists get it wrong, that's not going to happen. The point of this series is to just get everybody on kind of the same playing field before we go into the other, you know, the other evolution versus creationism stuff. Um, so the last thing I'll say before I get going, and I know everyone's like, get to the show. So um, the last thing is that if anybody has questions at any point during this, 
um, just let me know in the chat. And, um, you know, it's the equivalent of raising your hand, right? And I'll, I'll uh, see if I can address your question. And then we could also take a few minutes at the end if people want to do questions then. So that's what we're doing. That's why we're doing it. Uh, looks like there are a handful of people here, a whole nine people. I get a big audience. So um, thanks, everybody. Uh, so let's get into it. Today, we are going to talk about Darwin and the development of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Now, before we actually get into like the stuff, uh, I always start with something called outcomes. Outcomes are what I want you to get out of this. And this is like in real life. When I do class, I start every class with the outcomes for the class. And this is these chunks are going to be shorter than my regular classes. So there's only going to be a handful of outcomes for each uh, for each little little segment that we do for each episode that we do. So for today, the two big things I want you to be able to do uh, when we're done today is I want you to be able to sequence Darwin's logic that led him to the theory of evolution by natural selection. And I want you in a very general way to be able to sequence how natural selection works. We'll have a whole separate episode on natural selection down the road, and we'll like get into details, but I want you to have kind of big picture idea of how it works after today. You'll notice with the outcomes, it's not just know something. Every My goal for my students is always be able to do something. So what I want you to be able to do is sequence or explain Darwin's logic and sequence or explain how natural selection works. And I see uh, somebody asking about lag. Is anybody is anybody else lagging? Is it working okay? Just let me know. Let me check over uh, over here. Let's see. Um, just let me know if it's lagging before I keep going. Okay, seems okay. All right, we're going to keep going then. So here's what I want you to get out of this today. Be able to tell me how Darwin came up with his idea and basically how natural selection works in general. And by the way, this figure, this, I think, uh, you're going to see this again. This is really important. All right, so let's start just basic Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882. Fun fact, Charles Darwin, born on the same day in 1809 as Abraham Lincoln. They share a birthday. That's That's fun. Um, so a bit of background on Darwin. He was you know, relatively well off. His uh, grandfather was a well-known kind of philosopher, naturalist kind of guy. And um, at age 22, he didn't really know what he was going to do. He was going to be a doctor, um, but he apparently didn't like blood. Um, then he was going to go into the clergy. He was bored with that, spent all his time like classifying beetles. Um, so at age 22, he basically uh, convinced the captain of a surveying ship, the HMS Beagle, to take him on board as the you know, a naturalist. And um, take him on the voyage and and just be kind of on the boat. Um, and by the way, if anyone's watched uh, Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, there's a character in that movie that is basically Charles Darwin. Um, and they do visit the Galapagos in that movie. It's the same basic idea. Um, so he's on the surveying ship, the HMS Beagle. And they go around the world. I'll show you a map on the next slide. And this whole time, he's collecting specimens. He's taking notes. He's recording biodiversity. He's comparing things from all different parts of the world. Um, and he becomes, over the course of the voyage, and then they get back, and he just writes and writes and writes, and he becomes a really well, uh, well-regarded well naturalist. Um, he became an expert in barnacles. Yeah, that happened. And um, you can read his stuff on barnacles. I have not read it, um, but if you ever can't sleep, I'm sure it's it's just thrilling. Uh, his other his other writings that came out of the voyage are also very nice. Um, voyage of the Beagle, highly recommended if you if you haven't read it. Uh, and here's a nice painting that someone did of uh, the voyage. This is the Beagle going through the passage from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean at the southern tip of South America. Um, there's actually a channel through those islands that is called the Beagle Channel because the Beagle was the first European ship to navigate it. So you've got the uh, Strait of Magellan, you've got the Beagle Channel, and the Drake Passage as the three most famous passages between the Atlantic and the Pacific down there. Uh, the Beagle Channel, obviously, my favorite name for the Beagle. So here is a map of the voyage. And what you can see here is uh, that it went all around the world. Um, and it took a whole five years. Now, unfortunately, I can't, uh, I haven't quite gotten this quite to the place where I can show you my cursor. I'll get this working eventually, I swear. Um, but what I want you to look at is not just the Galapagos Islands, which are just to the left of South America, right before it across the Pacific Ocean, um, but 
before that is really the important part because it took four years out of the five to reach the Galapagos Islands. And along the way, you can see as they hop from England in kind of the top middle here, all the way down across the Atlantic and South America, it's not a straight shot. They're kind of jumping at all different islands. So they stop at the Azores, the Cape Verde Islands, they hop, they kind of hopscotch their way down the coast of South America, and then back up the Pacific coast of South America, eventually making it to the Galapagos. Now, after they hit the Galapagos, then it was like a year and they were back. The whole rest of that voyage only took a year. Now, the South American part of this was hugely influential for Darwin for a number of reasons. Uh, one, he collected fossils, he collected live specimens that he brought back with him, he collected live specimens from islands in the Atlantic and the Pacific and the mainland in both Africa and South America, and those comparisons became enormously important. And one really important thing that Darwin did was in South America, I forget if it was Atlantic or Pacific coast, but at some point when he was on the coast of South America, he witnessed an earthquake. This is the really big, th one of the big formative events in his life, because here's Charles Darwin. He's looking at things like the Andes Mountains. He's looking at the Cape Verde Islands, right? He's looking at these geological formations that are huge. And he witnesses an earthquake, one of the most powerful and destructive events humans can possibly witness. Does it make mountains? Does it make islands? No. He's able to measure the degree to which some formation shifted as a result of that earthquake. And it was, it was a powerful earthquake. It was like a meter or two, but it wasn't the Andes Mountains, right? So he's looking at these processes that he's observing and looking at the world as it exists and saying, you know, I think that had to take a long time. And this is kind of a trend in the natural sciences. The ideas like an old earth, like gradual change, like extinction, these ideas actually first came from geologists. Uh, and then they were kind of taken over by the field that became biology, right? But it started with geologists. And Darwin, in his own thinking, is actually starting with geology and witnessing events, catastrophic events, and seeing that they just didn't, didn't make that big a difference. Okay, so that's what that's that's one of the big formative events for Charles Darwin. So now, of course, the most famous part of this whole thing is the Galapagos children behave yourselves in the chat. Behave yourselves. This is not about this is not about debating evolution or creationism. All right. So <laughs> in the Galapagos Islands, uh, what Darwin witnessed here was really important because he he is comparing island specimens to mainland specimens, and he's comparing island specimens to each other. What he finds is on different islands, both within the Galapagos and comparing them to other uh, groups of islands, you find the same basic kinds of organisms, but you find larger differences than he expected. And by watching these different species of you know, birds, finches most famously, but not just finches, he was able to see that these differences are due to the fact that they use different food sources. Basically, they live in different places, they utilize different resources, and the word for that that Darwin didn't have, but the word for that is ecological niche. Different species use different ecological niches, and they're well adapted to their specific niche. That's what Darwin observed, and those observations obviously became really important towards forming his ideas. So before we get into what Darwin actually concluded, let's look at two of his main influences. Uh, one of them is Charles Lyell, who was a geologist, and he came up with the idea, or I should say he kind of formalized the idea of uniformitarianism. This is taking the idea of gradualism and making it a little more systematic and saying not just that, that things are, are gradual over time, but saying that the processes we are observing now operate in the present the same way as in the past. Now, the field of geology has moved on from this idea, but this was kind of the state of the art when Darwin was actually on the voyage. And I believe he actually had uh, Charles Lyell's uh, book, Principles of Geology, with him on the Beagle. The other person that Darwin was very strongly influenced by, and this wasn't until after he got back, uh, he read this person's work, was Thomas Malthus. Now, who has heard of Malthus? Because he doesn't usually come up in like the field of biology, right? So Thomas Malthus was an economist, and his big claim to fame was that populations grow faster than the food supply. 
So at some point you have a resource crunch. He basically came up with the idea of scarcity in economics. That, that concept, if you've ever taken like economics 101, you know the word scarcity. That concept comes from Malthus. And this leads to competition. So this is a very simple schematic representation of Malthus's kind of big idea. So on the y-axis, you have quantity, and on the x-axis, you have time. And the curve represents population, while the line represents food supply. And Malthus said, you know, humans, we're down here on the left, where the population is below the food supply. But at some point, the population is going to cross that line, and the population is going to exceed our ability to have enough food for everybody. And the term that he came up with for that is Malthusian catastrophe, right? That's when you're, you have a, a scarcity of some resource. There just isn't enough of it to go around. Okay, that's going to be really important for Charles Darwin when he's putting all of his ideas together. So we're going to come back to this graph in a few minutes. So before we get to Darwin's big ideas, everybody good? Any questions? Any technical issues? How's everybody doing? Hey, we're up to 14 people. Look at that. Cheers, everybody. Thank you all for being here. And yes, and then came technology, which is really good. So fortunately, we, we no longer have this problem of, uh, you know, we're not worried about the food supply. We have almost 8 billion people now, and we're, we're generating a large surplus of food. So good for humans. Good job, technology. Okay, so now let's get into Darwin's big ideas. The first thing we got to establish is what he was, what he was observing, what he pointed out. And the thing, the, the four big things that he pointed out, one is overproduction, and don't worry, we're going to go through these one by one, um, but he had overproduction, unequal survival and reproduction, heritable variation, and non-random survival and reproduction. Those are Darwin's big ideas. So let's get into them one at a time. All right, first thing is overproduction. Okay, this is the first observation. So what this just means here is that in each generation, you have more offspring are born than will survive and reproduce. Okay, so you've got in this population of 10 bugs, right? At birth, you've got 10, but by the, they're not all going to survive. And by the time you get to adulthood, maybe you only got five. Okay, so that's overproduction. The environment can only support so many individuals per generation, but more individuals are born each time around, and then many don't make it to adulthood. Okay? Observation number one. Observation number two, unequal survival and reproduction. So since there is overproduction, that means some individuals are going to survive longer than others. And of those survivors, some are going to have more kids than others. There's going to be variation in reproductive output. So some individuals might have a lot of offspring, like the second one down there. It's got a lot of kids. The top one only has one. The fourth one down doesn't have any. Bad luck. Oh, well. Um, so there's going to be there's going to be differences in re, in survival and reproduction. Okay, that's observation number two. Observation number three is that there is heritable phenotypic variation in the populations. Individuals have variation, and the offspring tend to look like their parents. Right, stuff is heritable. So here we've got a bunch of bugs. Now they're different colors instead of all being orange. Well, the offspring they look like their parents. Right, the red one has red kids, the blue one has blue kids, the orange ones have orange kids. Eh, the purple ones, you know, unlucky, but would have had purple kids. Okay, so that's observation number three. Okay, that's heritable phenotypic variation. And then the fourth observation is non-random survival and reproduction. Going back to number two, the unequal survival and reproduction. It's not just flipping a coin. It's not just rolling dice. It's non-random. Survival and reproduction is based on those phenotypes that we talked about in observation number three, right? So the best adapted individuals, the ones that are best suited for their environment, they're the ones that are going to have the most offspring. So looking at our bug population, again, we start with 10, but that's overproduction. So only five make it to adulthood. There's variation phenotypically in those five. And the kids are going to look like the adults, their parents. But those five, it's not random who has the most kids. In this example, if you're orange, you're more likely to survive and you're more likely to have more kids. So you can look and see from the parent generation at birth to the parent generation at adulthood to the offspring generation, being orange is beneficial. In this silly little example, orange being orange, that is an adaptation. That is a trait that makes you more likely to survive and reproduce. It is a 
beneficial characteristic. Okay, so those are the four observations. Okay, so it's overproduction, unequal survival and reproduction, heritable variation, and non-random survival and reproduction. That's where we're at right now with Darwin's observations. So now let's put Darwin's theory together. Okay, Darwin's theory has two main parts here. The first is descent with modification. Those are Darwin's words, descent with modification. This is a process. This means that populations change over time, or I should say populations change over generations. The parents have one set of phenotypes at different frequencies. The offspring are going to be somewhat different from that. You can see that, actually, if we go back a slide right here, you can compare the frequencies of the different colors in the parent generation at birth and the offspring at birth, and you see that they're slightly different. That's descent with modification. And the second part of Darwin's theory is natural selection, and that's the mechanism that Darwin proposed to explain descent with modification. So this is how the populations change over time. And this is based on uh, phenotype. It's based on fitness, which is due to the phenotype. If you're better adapted, you're going to be more successful, which means you're going to live longer and you're gonna have more kids. Now, there's one thing I need to clarify here because this sounds like we're talking about inheritance, we're talking about genetics, right? We're talking about all that stuff, but you should note that the word gene didn't exist yet at this point. The field of genetics didn't exist at this point. So Darwin is describing what he is seeing, and he's hypothesizing a mechanism to explain that. Um, but he doesn't have the underlying genetic mechanism to explain what he's seeing at the macro level. So in subsequent episodes here, we're going to talk about those genetic mechanisms. But for today, don't worry about it. Just know that Darwin didn't have any of that stuff when he was doing his work. So this gets at the concept of evolutionary fitness, which is one of the most misunderstood ideas in biology. And you've probably heard the phrase survival of the fittest. Now that phrase is almost always taken incorrectly. We're gonna go through exactly what it means in a minute. But first we need to establish what fitness means. Fitness in an evolutionary sense does not mean physical fitness. Fitness refers to evolutionary fitness, which is reproductive success. It's all about making it to adulthood and having offspring. So there's lots of ways to measure evolutionary fitness, how many children an individual has, how many grandchildren, um, and also the rate of reproduction is one measure you can use. So like for viruses, for example, which is kind of what I'm really familiar with, you measure their fitness by how fast they reproduce. You, you measure something called doubling time. How fast does the population double? All right, that's a good measure of fitness for viruses. So, and yes, this is um, the more technical definition for evolution is change in allele frequency in a population over generations. Um, this description, descent with modification, is earlier than that because ideas like genes and alleles didn't exist yet. So like when Darwin was doing his work, the field of population genetics just didn't exist. So you couldn't describe it that way. But I, we will get to that description in a subsequent episode. So let's kind of drill down on this uh, this phrase, survival of the fittest, because it sounds like a tautology, right? You've probably heard uh, say, well, survival of those most likely to survive. Obviously, that's the case, but that's not what is meant here. So um, this is one of my favorite XKCDs. This is tautology club. The first rule of tautology club is the first rule of tautology club, right? Survival of the fittest is not survival of those most likely to survive. So let's break this down. First thing I want to say is this is not Darwin's phrase. Somebody else came up with this. I always forget who. Don't worry about it. Um, but what survival of the fittest actually means, it's not talking about individuals. It's talking about traits. So it's survival of the traits that are fittest. In other words, it's survival of the traits that are most adaptive. And remember, fitness does not mean physical fitness. It means reproductive uh, success, right? It means evolutionary fitness. So it's survival of the traits that promote reproductive success. Now you can kind of see where the underlying mechanism is coming in. So it's survival within a population, because remember, populations evolve, individuals do not. There's a big thing that came from Darwin and what set him apart from people like Lamarck earlier, which we didn't talk about, so don't worry about it. But the idea is that populations are the things that are changing. That's the idea of descent with modification. It's parents to offspring are different, and then the grand offspring are going to be different. That's descent with modification, so it's populations that are changing. So when we talk about survival of the fittest, it's survival within a population of the traits that promote reproductive success. 
And now you can start to see how the mechanism of natural selection works. Within a population, we're talking about the propagation of traits that promote reproductive success. If you have more kids, your kids are going to be a larger fraction of the next generation, and they're going to have your traits. If you have bad traits, if you have non-adaptive traits, then you're not going to have as many kids. Your offspring will represent a small fraction of the next generation, and those non-adaptive traits will decrease in frequency over generations. That's how survival of the fittest links with natural selection. Now, the underlying dynamic here is competition for resources, and this gets us back to Malthus. The big observation that Darwin made in this direction was that Darwin observed stable populations. And you could read, I strongly recommend you read his, uh, if you don't read uh, Origin of Species, at least read the, the paper that he uh, jointly presented with Wallace uh, in 1858. Um, goes into this in really concise, uh, really clear language, um, saying like bird populations, they have the capacity to have lots of individuals every generation, but you watch them for multiple generations and the population basically stays the same. So the populations are stable despite the capacity for extremely rapid growth. Why on earth is that happening? Well, he reasoned that they were beyond the Malthusian tipping point. So he was saying, if you look at population size versus resources, natural populations are on the right side of this graph. They're on the side of this graph that's beyond the tipping point where now uh, you have more mouths than there is food available. So you have competition and only the ones that are best adapted are actually going to survive and have kids. If you didn't have that resource limitation, then you wouldn't have natural selection operating because everyone would be able to get all the resources they needed. So this limitation in resources that Darwin identified based on stable populations, despite being able to grow, is kind of the underlying dynamic that imposes natural selection on populations. Is everybody okay so far? Is everyone clear with, with that stuff? Any questions at this point? Yeah, grandchildren is a better measure um, because if you have lots of kids but they cannot or do not reproduce, then that's no good. Um, yes, so grandchildren is a better measure than kids, but it depends on kind of the, the specific thing you're looking at. So like, uh, I'll give you an example in viruses, um, you do like a burst size assay where it's you try to capture one generation. Um, and then it's just how many viruses do you get from a single virus? It's just number of kids, not grandkids. Um, but viruses are weird. If you're de dealing with like mammals, grandkids are a better measure. Okay, so let's jump back into it. We are almost done here. Um, so let's just kind of run down Darwin's logic here and then see how he derived his conclusions, okay? So we're going to do this real granular. So observations. Populations have the capacity for rapid population growth. But populations tend to be stable. They're not just growing exponentially all the time. Survival and reproduction are unequal. That has to be the case given the rapid growth but the stable size. There's a lot of individuals that are born every year that lose and some win. Okay, so we have unequal survival and reproduction. We see the populations have phenotypic variation, right? Not everybody is going to be identical. There's going to be differences in the individuals. And that variation is heritable. So if you have a certain trait that has, there's genes or alleles associated with that trait, then your kids are likely to inherit those alleles and they will probably exhibit that same trait, right? So the, the variation is heritable and the offspring tend to resemble the parents. And then finally, survival and reproduction is non-random, right? It's not just flipping a coin. It's based on that heritable phenotypic variation. The variants that are best adapted to their environment, they have most kids and those traits become more common. The ones that are least well adapted have fewer kids, and those traits become less common over generations. Okay, so all of those observations put together, we can get into Darwin's conclusion. So the first one is that favorable traits adaptations increase in frequency over generations. I keep writing over time, but I should be saying over generations, beneficial traits increase in frequency. Populations diverge over time, leading to speciation. So for example, using the, the, the classic finch in the Galapagos, right? You have a parent species makes it to the islands. You've got a bunch of resources that are available. 
Now you can have adaptations that occur randomly, right, through mutation and things, and you're able to utilize different resources. You have a bigger beak, a smaller beak, whatever the case is, live in trees, live on the grounds, utilize different resources. Well, as you adapt to those different resources, different subgroups can diverge from each other because they are independently kind of on their own trajectories doing descent with modification due to selection to utilize different resources, right? So now we have a mechanism for speciation. And the last thing that Darwin concluded, the big picture thing, was he looks at this. He looks at islands like the Galapagos, and he compares them to mainland South America. And then he compares that to Africa and Atlantic islands. And he says, you know what? This is not a limited process. This process is not just limited to this case or this case or this case. This process is universal. And everything that's alive right now, all extant biodiversity, shares common ancestry if you go back far enough in the past. Right? That's the big 30,000 foot conclusion that Darwin was able to draw as an implication of his theory of descent with modification via natural selection. Okay, so that's Darwin's logic. So this is one of my favorite sketches on the margins ever. This is Darwin's first, it's not really in the margin, it's actually a page of his notebook. This is Darwin's first evolutionary tree. This is uh, from 1839. And like it's if you've ever done phylogenetics, this tree is going to make your head explode because everything about it is wrong, um, but you can still interpret it. It still makes sense other than the handwriting, because as someone with terrible handwriting, even I cannot read Darwin's handwriting. But if you look at this tree, you've got one represents the common ancestor down there, and then you've got species uh, around the tree starting from the bottom right and going around. You've got A, B, C, D. Those represent the descendants from that common ancestor, and you can see that there are lots of other branches that represent descendants from that common ancestor. This is the basic idea of common ancestry. Darwin identified that this process happens, and in natural selection, he proposed a mechanism for this process. So the interesting thing is you'll notice, this is from 1839, but uh, I should have noted earlier that the, the voyage of the Beagle was 1831 to 35, 30 to 35, somewhere around, it was early 30s. Um, this was from 1839, but he didn't publish in 1839. He didn't publish in 1849. He published the work, Origin of Species, uh, in 1859. He was a bit conflicted about this, and he really wanted to make sure it was super robust. Now, I didn't get into it, um, but Alfred Russell Wallace was doing similar things a little bit later to Darwin. And, oh, thank you. It was Herbert Spencer. Appreciate that. Thanks, Jackson. Um, so Alfred Russell Wallace was doing similar things. He was operating in what is now like Indonesia, um, not the, the Galapagos and South America, but he came up with the basic, same basic ideas on his own and wrote Darwin and said, hey, I got these ideas. What do you think? And Darwin kind of had one of those, oh, moments um, and realized he needed to get his ideas out the door. So they jointly published to the Linnaean Society in 1858. And then Darwin published his book in 1859 in which he outlined his major ideas, descent with modification, natural selection, and common ancestry. If anyone here has not read this book, if anyone is spending their evening watching this video, but you haven't read Origin of Species, strongly recommend you read Origin of Species. Darwin is a really good writer. Um, I think he's really engaging. At times, well, at times he can be a little bit dry, but that's more like Voyage of the Beagle. Origin is really good, I think, because he's making a case. Um, and it's really interesting the way he does it. He spends a lot of the book, for example, talking about uh, like agriculture and livestock and selected breeding. And he basically says, look, we know this stuff works. I'm just saying nature can do it too. Uh, and then he kind of goes from there and lays out his evidence in a lot of detail. Um, and funny thing, the Linnaean Society to this day gives out an award for excellence in evolutionary biology. Um, and it was called the Darwin Wallace Award. Um, because they presented in 1858. Um, Darwin first, because he was really the first to come up with the idea and had better support for it at the time. Um, but it's the Darwin Wallace Award, which is super cool. Now, what we've just talked about here is basically Darwinism, right? Um, populations change over generations, and the mechanism from that is natural selection. We don't have any genetics. We don't have any population genetics. We don't have any of the underlying molecular mechanisms. None of that stuff. We're going to get to that stuff down the road. Uh, we'll talk about you know what's beyond Darwinism, but for now, I just want you to know that Darwinism is not representative of modern evolutionary theory, of modern evolutionary biology. The field, as you might imagine, has come a long way since uh, the 1850s. Um, and even Darwin, as he revised Origin of Species, um, 
actually made some pretty significant changes uh, over over the course of his his revisions and con continuing work uh, into the 1860s and even into the 1870s. So here is the summary of what we've talked about today. Uh, Darwin observed heritable variation and competition from resources in natural populations. He also uh, observed adaptation to utilize specific resources. And based on his series of observations, he was able to conclude that populations have descent with modifications, so they change over generations. Uh, the mechanism for this is natural selection. And over time, you have speciation and ultimately common ancestry among everything that is alive today. That's what Darwin came up with and kind of the, the underlying ideas and logic that led him to his conclusions. So that is all we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to pick up in 1859, and we're going to go forward in time, and we'll talk about evolutionary theory since Darwin. This is a slide I use in my classes to kind of frame this. Uh, and we'll, we'll next, uh, next episode, we'll talk about some of these ideas like population genetics and mutation and neutral theory and genomics and epigenetics and all this fun stuff. So that's it for this episode. Thank you, everybody. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'll go back to the, go back to the summary slide. Does anybody have any questions before we wrap this up? Question: What does I'm going to wait for it to pop up on uh, Streamyard so I can uh, so I can put it on screen? But what does Darwin mean by races in his title? He means species. Um, what he means there is is species. Yeah, but also that's not to say that Darwin wasn't a racist. Darwin was an enormous racist. Um, he was progressive for his time, um, but by modern standards, he was uh, an ab absolutely despicable racist. So uh, by racism in his title, he's talking about species or lineages. Um, that are competing with each other. Um, but uh, yeah, that's not to say he, he didn't have despicable thoughts about human races. Uh, he absolutely did. Yeah. Yep, I got it. I pulled it up. Uh, yes, yeah, so he uses, yeah, he uses races in, in not uh, modern context. Any others, or um, should we call it good? I think we're good. All right, well, thank you, everybody. I hope you all had fun hearing me talk about Darwin for 40 minutes, just kind of rambling here. Um, so, oh, we have a few more questions. Hit me. Let's do it. Thank you. I uh, hope, Hopefully next week will be the next one. All right, David, what do you got? I got time for, we'll say two more. Thank you, Scott. Uh, here we go. Okay, what was the scientific understanding before Darwin? Um, did science and church believe organisms are fixed? That's a really fun question. The answer is no. Um, you actually can go back to the 1600s to a guy named Nicholas Steno, who was finding things like uh, shark teeth in mountains. And then um, you've got guys like, um, oh, who was it? It was uh, George Buffon, um, I think was one of them, who came up with the ideas of like extinction. Uh, and then, of course, Lamarck um, actually came up with a natural theory of evolution that turned out to be wrong. Um, but he was able to, he came up with an, a, a theory of evolution uh, through uh, use and disuse and the inheritance of acquired traits. So it's a different mechanism from Darwin, turned out to be wrong. Um, and no, modern epigenetics is not Lamarckian. There are differences, and we'll talk about that at some point down the road, probably. Um, but yeah, so it wasn't just everything is constant before Darwin. There was a long tradition, centuries of work kind of leading to Darwin, coming from both biology and geology. Uh, let's see. So let's, uh, that one, um, do prions evolve? Um, you know, I don't know. You would think, I'm not sure. I don't know. That's a good question. Sorry. Um, why do you think creations have problems conceptualizing 
uh, deep time. Um, I also don't know. Um, I think as creationists would be the best answer there. Um, I don't have I don't have an opinion uh, in terms of the why. Sorry. Okay, I think uh, 845, yeah, I think it's good. I think we'll, we'll wrap this up. We'll call that about 45 minutes. That was fun. Um, thank you, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed. I hope you all have a great night. And do me a solid, um, if you're enjoying my stuff, subscribe, share it, you know, spread the word, try to, try to get this stuff out there. So do me a favor and, and do that if you, if you are enjoying what I'm doing. Um, so with that, thank you, everybody. Have a great night, and I will, uh, I will see you all soon.